Anuj Narotra, Dean of the School of Business at the George Washington University. And it is, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this episode of George Talks Business, which is hosted in partnership with two student organizations, I'm glad to say, GW Women in Business and Delta Sigma Pi student organizations. Today, our distinguished guest is Barbara Humpton, President and CEO of Siemens USA. Thank you for very much for being here, Barbara. Anush, it's great to be here tonight. And thank you for actually wearing the GW colors as well. <laughs> so, and by the way, thank you all for who have submitted questions and we have tried to incorporate many of those questions in there. I know the GW Women in Business Executive Board submitted many of those questions, so we may not be able to get to all of them, but we will have some time at the end to have that Q&A, so please save your questions then. Uh, for that time in any case. So let's jump right in, Barbara. I was looking at some of your posts today, and one of the posts mentioned that today is Siemens' 175th birthday, and that Siemens has been inventing the future. So we will want to get to the future, but I want us to first start with the present, and if you could talk a little bit about Siemens, what are the products, what is the technology, what, what does Siemens do, and just a little bit for us, for our audience, to be able to hear about Siemens. Oh, thank you. And Anuj, what, let me just actually rewind way back to set the stage, because it's actually important how Siemens was started. Uh, it informs what we do today. Um, I like to tell people that Siemens would have been a garage startup if garages had been invented. Right? It's, <laughs> that's, that's how uh, advanced these folks were. Werner von Siemens and his brother actually got started and it was actually one of the, one of the early things they did was expand internationally. They, they were in Berlin, they expanded internationally and they were key to communications, the pointer telegraph the transatlantic cable. If you go to the Capitol, you'll find a little lunette that has you know, the lady holding up the transatlantic cable. Well, that was a Werner von Siemens accomplishment along with many others. Um, so the, he and his brother recognized that the dramatic changes in the way we communicate, the way we travel, the way we work would be a real business opportunity. And that informs what we do today. So for all these decades, for the industrial revolutions, first steam and then electric and then automation, and now the fourth industrial revolution, the integration of data into everything that we do, Siemens today is focused on transportation. We have a train factory in Sacramento, California, and we make the locomotives that pull Acela trains up and down the, the corridor. We have a business that's focused on what we call smart infrastructure. And think about the edge of the grid from medium voltage down to low voltage and then into buildings, the technology that's in buildings, all of that is becoming more interconnected and the two-way flow of electricity. I think the grid edge may be one of the most exciting places to be and to innovate right now. And then the third big piece of business is in manufacturing. The software and the hardware that make factories more sustainable, more productive. And, and actually one of the things I'm really excited about is what's happening in the US with manufacturing being supported here. We now have the tools to make manufacturing very affordable right here in the United States. So look for growth in all of those areas. And as, as you heard me describe this, you might have already said, hmm, we, there was a bipartisan infrastructure bill and there was a, a CHIPS Act and a, there was a uh, in, Inflation Reduction Act. All of those investments that are being made now are priorities for the US government and in fact, what, what we all recognize is this Siemens technology is in the backbone of the economy. But not only here, we're in the US, but my colleagues are helping to manage Siemens in um, 160 countries around the world. Once somebody told me 210 countries around the world, I said, I'm not sure there are 210 <laughs> countries around the world. So that's, that's great, that's a quick uh, synopsis of what Siemens does, and you did mention that it's worldwide, it's a global, global yes. brand. Are there things in other parts of the world that Siemens manufactures that we wouldn't see in US? Oh. And, and, and what kind of, what, what, how do you decide what to be manufacturing where, for example, from the manufacturing arm? Oh, well, okay, so first of all, this is Siemens' biggest market. I, this, I, here in the US, we're doing about 25% of Siemens' business globally. 
And for just about everything that Siemens does anywhere, you'll find that business also located here in the US. And you can understand why. If somebody says, hey, I've got a great idea, I'm selling these new tools and capabilities in some other market, ooh, the US market is irresistible, right? Think about it. Here we've got customers with real demand, we've got innovation going on everywhere, we've got access to talent because some of the best educational systems in the world. And so everyone in Siemens wants to plant their flag in the US. You'll find us in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. You'll find us doing business with 100 major cities across the US. This is a very 40,000 employees distributed across the US. And, and our US headquarters is right here in Washington, DC. So let me ask you about from a global brand perspective, we went through this COVID. Uh, as a business school dean, I had you know uh, a lot of lo you know lot of conversations with other business school deans, but I did not have to listen to them because their brand was different from mine. Right here, you are talking about 160 countries potentially. Did you all, as CEOs, get together on the phone to decide how to handle some of the challenges? And I would imagine that 160 you know type A personalities and CEOs would have 160 different views potentially. So how do you, in a multinational company? arrive at some consensus where the company's brand is preserved in ways they are handling a crisis like this? This is such an excellent question because what I will tell you is that COVID gave us one of the most valuable business lessons we've had in our history. And it was this, empowerment. You know, you talk about empowerment a lot, but it's very tempting in a large corporation to rely on command and control. What happened in COVID was that we knew everyone everywhere was gonna be experiencing the same effects of a disease. But it was happening at different times and everyone had different regulatory frameworks, different cultural frameworks, just at, at, you know, different effects in the economy. And so uh, Siemens being a German company has a supervisory board, which you'd think of like our governance boards in US corporations. They have a managing board. This is the top executive team that's truly running the global enterprise. And, and so I report into our global CEO, a very small group of people, call it 20, uh, who manage the major businesses and functions of Siemens and the major countries met every week, sometimes twice a week in those early days. And the company set four priorities. Actually, they only set three. It was take care of employees, take care of your business. You know, the, those two things kind of, uh, you know, go hand in hand. And the third was help your customers. Mm -hmm. I added one more in the US, which is let's look across the horizon and figure out what we need to be doing now that's gonna be important as we emerge from COVID. I mean, people wanted to be active, they wanted to be proactive. And, and what we unleashed just by setting these four simple priorities was we found leaders everywhere in the organization. Now, what we've learned from that is guidance for a global corporation, if you can handle it, can be lightweight. We've been in the business of eliminating global circulars, the processes and things that have been published over almost two centuries about you know, sort of dictating how things work, getting simpler and simpler and simpler. And I, I have a favorite phrase, which is rules are guidelines for people with no judgment. <laughs> and so the more we can eliminate just the rules that everybody sort of takes and says, oh, because corporate said so, the more we allow real people to be innovative and to seize opportunities that are ahead of them and to engage and make things happen. And, and indeed, that's, we, we've seen the business flourishing even in the midst of all this disruption. I'm gonna peel out uh, many questions that you have mentioned, but let me, let me first return to something that I should not forget to ask you because a lot of our students are very inspired by you being one of the few women leading some major corporation in, in the world, so, so to speak. And many of them have been told by many guests that they should learn to take risks. <laughs> so their question is, an interest in some uh, uh, of your career journey, yes. as well as a question about what is the biggest risk you have taken professionally? Mm. Mm. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> I love that question. I, my own journey uh, it feels simple now when I look back on it. At the time, as I was going through various phases of my career, I had those moments of what happens next? 
But I, I started as, uh, I studied mathematics at Wake Forest University. I got recruited by IBM to become a programmer. Back when they were simply just taking anyone who could, you know, hey, we're, uh, there, there was no computer science department at Wake Forest when I graduated. Uh, but they took as many mathematicians as they could find. So I got to work on, I got to work on things that really mattered in the world. Uh, the, the first work I did was classified, but let me just say it helped to end the Cold War. And then I got to be part of the global positioning system, now a utility available worldwide we couldn't live without. I had, got to help customs and border protection with cargo screening for risk management at the borders. I got to help the FBI with biometrics to help with law enforcement. And, and so at each step along my career path, I, I was literally just answering the call. I was with a single organization that kept saying, hey, Humpton, you know, here's, we, we, need, you, we need you at GPS, show up at three o'clock. And, and so I was following the guidance of the people I worked for. Early on, I was told, uh, you're, don't, don't plan on being on an executive path. I mean, frankly, you had to choose between a mother and being an executive. And I had, I had two children by the time I had that mentoring conversation. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so for me, the, the assumption was simply, gosh, keep doing the things that are fulfilling. Keep digging into the work ahead of you. And, and what it led to was this incredible uh, opportunity to learn to learn how big complex organizations work, to learn how to get things done. And so, um, it, it, so then when the call came from Siemens, hey, we'd like to invite you to come to Siemens because we're working on some of the biggest and gnarliest things with the US federal government and your background serving that sector could be very helpful to us. So I went to the library checked out the annual report and found out this is a company that has built its business strategy around five megatrends, climate change, urbanization, the aging demographics of people everywhere. Do you know the first person to live to be 150 has already been born? Might be one of you. Um, at the, the, um, the ever increasing global supply chain and the digitalization of everything, five megatrends form the basis for our business strategy. And all I can tell you is if you form your business strategy around inexorable forces, <laughs> you don't have to worry about business development. So you, so there are a lot of things there again, but let me bring <laughs> you back to so many crises that yeah. are taking place right now. Energy crisis, COVID pandemic response, the war in Ukraine, supply chain disruptions and whatnot. Yeah. And how has Siemens helped you know, uh, handle some of these and how, what is their um, response to it? And then you mentioned the infrastructure bill and how has that helped or hurt yeah, yeah. Uh, the kind of operations that you were seeking now? Yeah, it, so, so yeah, there's so much going on around the world and in the midst of COVID as the, it's interesting, we, as you asked about what's the biggest risk we took. The biggest risk we're all taking is living people. Mm -hmm. Right? There Continue is a, taking the risk, just so that you know, please. <laughs> there, is, there is nothing harder right, than, than, than simply saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go about my business. I'm going to get my education. I'm going to move forward. Think about all the things that are going on and how easy it would be to just curl up and say, ah, this is too hard. And, and so when, when COVID hit and a lot of businesses, I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of businesses kind of curtailed, kind of pulled back. Maybe now's the time to be conservative. At Siemens, what we chose was this is a time to step forward, raise our hand and say, we, we recognize there are things only we can do. There are, there are things that we can help do. We'll be here for that. Mm -hmm. Our supply chain organization if you've been exposed to companies, you may have seen this, that often the people who manage the supply chain have been in a little box on the org chart, maybe tearing into the CFO or, you know, somewhere, procurement contracts. There's, you know, oh, those supply chain people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They try to, they try to go buy things at good prices. They became our heroes in the midst of COVID because suddenly they were in touch around the world with suppliers of, vital things that, I mean, what you might not have realized is that, you know, the, in order for people to deliver your PPE, they needed 
tools in their factories. In order to get tools in their factories, they needed gear from Siemens, and we needed uh, semiconductors, you know, and so on and so forth. This incredibly complex supply chain, you know, obviously became, that became the driver for everything we were doing. And I mentioned this at length just to say, this is something that we can all learn from, that large organizations have specialties. They have functions. And a lot of people are tempted to say, well, it's the salesperson, it's the business leader who makes things happen, when in fact, it takes all of us. And what you want to do is find yourself in an organization that puts expertise around the table. Experts in communications, experts in cybersecurity, experts in legal and compliance, because every single one of those skills is needed at some point or another for the overall success of the organization. And this is what we've seen flourishing um, at Siemens. So all of these things are disruptions, but what we've been attempting to do is be agile to adjust and say, where is the need right now? Uh, hospital construction for a while was, you know, we were focused there. Residential construction boomed as people said, I want to move out of my office and I want, to, I want a bigger house. Now residential construction has quieted and now inner cities, you know, are making changes. We're building data centers and, you know, so on and so forth. So we're flexing with the needs of the marketplace. Will the investments that are being made by the federal government um, make a big difference? Yes, but, but in an interesting way. I, I don't think Siemens will be the direct beneficiary of government dollars. Our, our customers will. But what's even more powerful is that when the US government or any government around the world makes a bet, places an investment into a sector like semiconductors, what they're telling the market is, we're investing in this, we, we, we want to see this grow. So what's far greater than the investment that'll come from government is the investment that will come from the private sector. And we're seeing this uh, just last week in New York, there are Micron and $100 billion in central New York, right? The investments in Ohio and Arizona. Uh, we're talking, they, the numbers just make everything the government will do pale in comparison. But without that government investment, it might not have been the US where that, where that investment would be made. It's wonderful, that, what a great answer there. So let me get back to the first question. You know, when we talked about inventing the future. So yeah. let's shift gears towards innovation uh -huh. and some of the emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Uh, what, are, what is Siemens doing in it and what does the future look like? What does the future look like? Okay, everybody get out your phones because I want you to look up my podcast, The Optimistic Outlook. So this started during COVID. Um, I actually, yes, you have permission to use your phones. This, yeah. Um, during COVID, uh, when, when we learned that, hey, people actually want to do more, people want to know what happens next, um, my team set up a series of interviews for me to do with people in various sectors of infrastructure. I had the opportunity to talk to people who've devoted their lives to the grid, the electric grid, and what happens next. Uh, talk to people who are experts in transportation systems. Talk to folks about the future of manufacturing. You name it. I've had a poet on the optimistic outlook. People say, what does that have to do with infrastructure? My answer, it takes people <laughs> to make infrastructure. And people need to tap into their creativity. And poets can help us do that. So I, I hope you'll listen, because the last question in every episode, usually, is, um, hey, if we're successful at implementing the things you've been working to bring to life, tell me what the future looks like. And it is so cool mm -hmm. to think about, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use three big terms that you hear all the time and you'll say, oh, that's fluff. It's more sustainable. It's more equitable. It's more resilient. The tools we have today are actually going to be elevating the role that the human being plays in our built infrastructure. There have been a lot of people who've said artificial intelligence, et cetera, I'm scared of that. Does this mean robots are coming to take over our jobs? And my answer to that is no. From the first time a person picked up a rock and used it as a tool, tools have elevated the roles of humans. Mm -hmm. And the tools we have today are no different. 
we're going to be doing different things. We're going to be doing different things. We're going to be doing the things that require a human touch. We're going to be expanding what's humanly possible. So the things we're working on right now are how to get first, how to electrify more of our infrastructure because we know that we've got to decarbonize our infrastructure overall. Transportation, buildings, these are big sectors that need decarbonization. Mm -hmm. That means electrification. And, and then the support with power from clean energy. We spun out Siemens Energy two years ago, and it was all of the fossil power generation, all the renewable power generation, and then high voltage transmission and distribution so that they could address the needs of any country at whatever state to help them along that journey. We at Siemens now will take that power that gets generated, we'll take it down into the medium and low voltage, we'll be distributing that. But, but imagine a future that's more connected and autonomous. Imagine the things around you knowing your preferences. We know we've been building that in our social lives, in our entertainment lives. All of that technology is coming to infrastructure near you. But the interesting thing about it is that some of the tools that have been invented over these last five years or so are going to get their first and most important use in the industrial space. Mm -hmm. The metaverse? Mm -hmm. The metaverse is interesting. The industrial metaverse is fascinating. It's the next thing you're going to need to watch after you've listened to all my podcast episodes is uh, the episode where uh, our CEO, Roland Bush, talks to um, NVIDIA about the industrial metaverse. And you, you take the tools Siemens has built that allow us to create the digital twins of virtually anything. And we, we use this for design, for engineering. The Mars rover was, was designed and built using technology from Siemens that allowed us to simulate that landing on Mars and ensure the, the rover would perform well. It's the same software that Estee Lauder uses to, mm. to plan their cosmetic line. It's, you know, it's just bizarre that, that industries of all kinds can use these same tools. But, but now we put that together with photorealistic rendering. And now you have the ability in, in the industrial metaverse to maybe do the training so someone doesn't have to deal with a dangerous article as they're being trained. Maybe you can use the industrial metaverse as you design so collaborators can jointly be in the same space and be working on something at the same time. This is what is coming into your infrastructure. So, wow, I thought my job was very interesting, but clearly there is competition. Now, Can you I have to tell look at your how job. energized and, and, I am by this? And, and, I'm learning so much. Just try day. to be a little passionate, Barbara. That's about <laughs> it. But other than that, what a, what a great answer. Um, so you mentioned the Internet of Things. And we, our students hear a lot about Internet of Things. I hear a lot about Internet of Things. Tell us how our students need to prepare what kind of career changes will be needed? What yeah. kind of curricular changes need to be needed to be taking full advantage of what's to come? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's so funny because a lot of parents will ask me, what should I encourage my children to study in yeah. order to be prepared for this you know, sort of future? And I keep saying, tell them to play video games, which, I mean, I know that's a really oddball thing to say, but, but actually the skills we're gonna need to be proficient in when we're using tools that are really in a, you know, a, a, um, a computer generated environment, it, it's gonna feel, I think some of these things are gonna feel more like video games. Am I saying we don't need engineers in the future? Absolutely not. So what I'm hoping is that students are getting a deep grounding in the classic knowledge that you're going to need for your preferred field. Right, there is, there's a discipline, there's a history, and it's important to know and understand that. But, but honestly, all you need to focus on right now is making sure that you know how to learn. Because what's gonna happen is that as the world around you keeps innovating and you are working with organizations who are operating, maybe I'm gonna say the word compete, but I'll come back to that because I want us to think differently about this. You're going to be seeing different business models, different technical capabilities, different things sweep through, and your confidence in your ability to learn anything 
is all you need. I, the, the, we, had a, we had a meeting at Siemens Corporate Technologies Headquarters in Princeton, New Jersey, and we invited in some of our academic partners, some of the top minds who work with us on basic research and development. We had this conversation. What are the things students need to study now so they can be prepared for the jobs of the future? And only two words came out of the final report that, that we produced, curiosity and initiative. If you can cultivate the kind of passion that makes you jump out of bed and run to work, if you can enjoy, feel the joy and, and want to learn more, and then take the initiative to go get involved, do the things that need to be done. It sounds simple, but honestly, that's all you need. I, people used to say, when I started, I started at IBM, and it was a career, this was meant to be you know, my life until retirement, and they started introducing the concept that the people might actually change companies four or five times in a career. And now I look back on that and, and chuckle a little bit and say, what was everybody afraid of? Mm -hmm. Right, choosing your organization, choosing whether you'll stay with that organization or if this is a growth opportunity that launches you into your next phase at another organization, all of that is good. The future is networked. So you mentioned curiosity and initiative. I have one third one to add there is integrity because without the integrity, uh, the curiosity and initiative can be really devastating. To the well, world. Can, so. I, can I share with you? <laughs> I told you I was on the GW Contracts Advis GW Law Contracts Advisory Board for a period of time. When I first joined um, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm Barbara Humpton from Siemens, I met a bunch of lawyers and their first greeting to me was, oh, I missed the bribery scandal. The bribery scandal was, in fact, a, a huge issue. In 2008, Siemens had a global crisis because people in other countries had been engaged in all kinds of practices that were unacceptable and inappropriate. The corporation cleaned house from the top to the bottom. And, and, and so I arrived at Siemens at a time when I had come from government contracting where integrity, business conduct guidelines, this notion of we understand where the line is drawn and we do not cross it, that was, that was natural to me. And I was a little worried, quite frankly, about what's it gonna be like coming to a foreign owned company and a company doing business in the commercial space. And what I quickly learned is that the rules I learned working with the US federal government made me one of the strongest players on the commercial side of the house because this is how we run businesses today. Great. In a couple of minutes, I'm gonna start taking questions from the audience, although I have not been able to get to any of mine because I'm still working through your submitted I, do, questions. Do I need to be a little bit more <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> absolutely not, because it's so interesting. But let me ask one of my own questions here about you know, climate change. You yeah. mentioned the climate bill, uh, sustainability. This is a top of mind on almost every CEO that I talk to. Do companies need to work together? Oh on this to really make an impact? Yes, and we are. And how are you working? Give, can you give us some examples? Yeah, yeah uh, yes, we are. Well, first of all, Siemens was the first large industrial company globally made this commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030 and to be halfway there by 2020. This was a commitment we made in 2015, gave ourselves five years to get 50% of the reduction done. We actually accomplished 54%. So that, that point was accomplished. I, I will tell you though that the hard part is still ahead of us. We've got fleets of cars, we've got fleets of buildings. Getting the real estate sector converted is gonna be one of our heaviest lifts. But, but what's been fascinating about this is the recognition that no company does this alone. You've heard talk of scope one, scope two, scope three. We've got our supply chain you know, getting bought in. We actually use something we call the green digital twin. When we make buying decisions, we're actually assessing what is the carbon impact of this in our overall supply chain. And by the way, one more thing, we, we uh, widened our scope. We're gonna be net zero by 2030. And we've got a program we call DEGREE, decarbonization, ethics, governance, resource efficiency, equity, and my favorite, employability. Mm -hmm. Recognizing, right, th this is what we're about. And people ask all the time, oh, is this your ESG program? It's not a program, it's who we are. 
But, but again, who do we rely on? We've actually signed the climate pledge led by Amazon because they're huge, right? They're, they move markets. And we said, hey, we want to be with you as you move markets. And so we bring things to the table like electrification, EV charging. We made an investment to expand our EV charging manufacturing capability in the US. We invested just a little $54 million to expand our operations. And we're going to be, we're going to be manufacturing a million EV chargers over the next four years. So we, we know we are part of the change. We've got building technologies, et cetera. But what we need is others who are bringing in alternative fuels, others who are focused on um, uh, you know, the vehicles themselves, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm proud to say that businesses are working together. But there's an interesting dialogue that's emerging, which is businesses need to do more. Businesses are going to have to lead. And I think what we're seeing is in the political sphere, it's going to be hard for us to overcome our, you know, polarization in order to get things done. And so, I, by the way, I'm, I'm doing my part talking to both Republicans and Democrats about this is a nonpartisan issue. Mm -hmm. and, and we at Siemens find ourselves right smack dab in the middle it, working with everyone. Mm -hmm. Great. So if you would like to ask a question, could you please use the mic in the central room there and stand behind it? If you don't stand, I have my questions. It will continue. But if you have, this is your chance. I'm looking please for go. some bold people. <laughs> yes. Uh, please, you're welcome to stand. And I'll call on you as we go through. While they are, while they are doing that lining up yes. for the questions, let me ask you what entrepreneurial spirit means to you from a company perspective. When, you know, my board, when we were talking about what our strategy should be, how we should be looking at students and preparing them, yeah. they, not every student is going to go into a startup. Startup. Not right. every student is going to pursue their own company, but our board wanted us to inculcate somehow the entrepreneurial spirit in every student. How important it is to a CEO of a major company like this that their employees have entrepreneurial spirit, and what does it mean? It's everything. Okay, and here's entrepreneurial spirit. Every innovation, every, I, I, I challenge anybody to, to come up with a, a contrary example. Every innovation starts with two people over a napkin. I mean, right? Somebody has an idea, they share it with somebody else, and you work on it, pretty soon this thing grows. What's cool about a big company like Siemens is that we can take those ideas to world-changing scale. And in fact, this year, Fast Company named us world-changing company of the year. So it, don't think that if you're going to work for a large organization that entrepreneurial spirit is less important. Congratulations on hey, that. And that was my shortest answer, yes. That was so I awesome. saw the line. <laughs> I'm like, I want to talk to all of you. You have a long line of questions <laughs> here. So if you could identify yourself, what your major is, and just a very short question so that we can get as many as we can in this small amount of time. Thank you very much for staying back for these questions as of well. Of course. Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, Barbara. My name is Dami. I am a PhD biomedical engineering student. Um, so thank you for being here today. I really appreciate you. So my question is just knowing that you have a BS in mathematics, um, something I've heard often is to kind of climb up in the industry world, I need to have like a formal MBA education or a formal business degree. And so I'm curious what your advice would be for a STEM student who desires to kind of go on that executive leadership pathway, who does not necessarily have that formal MBA education, how should I start prepping myself, you know, right now in school and even just going? Great kind of question. Great. Like? Thank you. Um, hey, I will tell you, I have a PhD from the School of Hard Knocks. Right? <laughs> so I, you know, yes, I just came out of school with my math degree. I went straight to work. And, and my focus, I, I mean, the way I would put it now, the advice would be put points on the board, right? Get your, you know, get get deep into your um, passion, wh whatever that will be, as you begin working. And if you'd like to be engaged in management and in administration, you know, et cetera, as early as possible, start getting some exposure to the financial aspects of your business, and and pay, you know, get into. You'll find that for anything you do, there will be a budget associated with it. There will be plans that need to be developed, and pretty soon you'll be in the mix actually learning all the elements that you need in order to manage a business through your hands-on experience. But I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of us who learn really well on the job. 
And there are many who find they learn faster with formal education. So I would not discourage you from a formal education. You'll often hear people say, why don't you get into some experience in the working world and then go back to school? Again, for women, that can be hard because that happens just as you're in your childbearing years and you're you know, raising a family and it's mayhem. And that's what happened to me. I, you know, I just never got to it. So um, for me then, it was important to find the on-the-job opportunities and they're there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Claire Shelby and I'm a senior studying international business and French. And I'm wondering, our School of Business is um, incredibly dedicated to mentorship, and it's a crucial part of kind of how we operate. So what is the best piece of advice you have ever received from a mentor, and what is the, who's the best boss that you've had, and why? Oh, wow. Well, I, can I just tell you, I love my current boss. And, and my current boss, think about this, he's running this you know, corporation that is in all these countries and he's got, you know, a thousand businesses and the geopolitics and all this kind of stuff. And his theme is truly empowerment. And it's, it's really interesting. Try this yourself. If you're in a situation where people are looking to you and you're the leader, right? You do this on team projects, you do it. You can practice empowerment wherever you are. When someone comes to you and says, I need help, what should I do? Have your first question be, what do you think? What have you considered so far? It really turns the table. Mm -hmm. And when Roland said to me in front of, we were doing this big webinar with the, all the leadership of Siemens USA, 200 people on the webcast, and I asked a question about Roland, what should we do? And he said, I don't know, Barbara, you would know best. <laughs> you should have seen the expressions on that. Oh, he really trusts her. So, so, I mean, I think that's powerful. Mentorship is one of the most powerful forces in our career development. And um, in my world, what I like to do is ask mentees to be the ones to drive the relationship. So I hope if you have people you consider to be mentors, they love it when you call up and say, hey, do you have a minute? I, I'd really appreciate your insight just in the moment while you need help, you be the driver of that mentoring relationship. Thank Thanks. you so much. Hi, Barbara. My name is Emily Morris. I'm the president of GW Women in Business this year, so thank you so much for the Thank you for bringing out the team. Yeah, and also thank you, Dean Marotra, George Hawks Business. I see Dr. Orlova over there. So we've been working to curate this event. So thank you for speaking. Um, I'm an international affairs major and I'm a senior, but my question is, um, as a executive, a female executive in a male dominated industry, what's your best piece of advice for undergraduate women stepping into a career that may be in a male dominated industry? Mm -hmm. You are enough. I mean, I spent the first two thirds of my career having people tell me I needed to modify my leadership style. I needed to behave more like a man. I needed to, if I was going to have the gravitas to command the room, if I was ever gonna hope to be in this room on this stage, I needed to wipe that grin off my face. I was too nice. And a few years ago, what I learned is that I'm enough and that our business needs more of what I have to offer. So I will tell all of you, the business world needs you. There's so much work that needs to be done out there. So come with your whole self. Come ready to be yourself. And when you do, by the way, when you're not, if you, if you hear that soundtrack in your mind that says, am I doing it right, am I doing it right? That's your key that you're not because you are okay. And what you want to do is get into that zone, you know, where you lose track of time. You're working on a problem and you're so lost in it that you don't even see the hands on the clock spinning. You know you have what it takes to get it done and your team is going to back you up. That's, that's working in the zone and that's what we're striving for at Siemens. Thank, thank you. you. Excellent. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Oliver Jabour. I'm a sophomore majoring in international affairs, and I wanted to ask about um, Siemens government technologies. Um, what are they trying to focus in when looking for uh, new um, like job applicants or um, internships, and what might that look like? Uh -huh. Yeah, Siemens government technologies. Actually, I hope all of you will go to the web and look at Siemens jobs, and Siemens government technologies jobs are, are listed separately. They are a separately managed 
company with a separate board of directors because we're as a, as a German company, we can't influence uh, the work that they're doing with the federal government when it requires security clearance. Um, the things that uh, they're looking for are all the same things that we look for as a company because their whole purpose in life is to bring the technologies of the corporation to the needs of the federal government. And every once in a while, they'll um, secure a role that only Siemens government technologies can do. And I wouldn't know a thing about that. <laughs> but, but, but you'll see skills of all kinds. Uh, you know, you know, it takes all kinds. It takes, it takes people with backgrounds, people who know how to write, people who know how to speak, people who know how to solve engineering problems. We need all of you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Paul, and I'm doing my master's in uh, data analytics. So my question is, given that there's a lot of buzz around this uh, new inflation thing, as a leader of such a big corporation, how prepared are you, or what are the factors that you consider as a different strategy? In terms of inflation? <laughs> yes. Um, so interesting, as uh, I was in summer, I was out in Germany uh, with meeting with my fellow global leaders, and I heard one of our businesses comment that they've got a bad, thanks, thanks to supply chain disruption and people saying, ooh, I better order now so I can be in the list and so I can get my stuff, they've got a backlog that's many, many, many months, maybe a whole recessions period enough to sort of carry the organization through. That feels like a little bit of a security blanket, but I have a feeling we're, we're in for some twists and turns in this road. So, so what the team is working to do is on the one hand, we've gotta be responsive to the inflationary pressures on uh, salaries. Right, recognizing our employees are dealing with rising costs, and then finding creative solutions to manage that. And, and then likewise, we are dealing with the inflation of various products, and there we think that regionalizing supply chains is gonna be one of the answers. So you'll see us working closely um, in the Americas in particular, you know, I for Siemens USA, uh, working to regionalize supply chains and overcome some of the disruptions, which, I mean, listen, I'm not an economist, but everybody keeps thinking that just monetary policy is all that's needed in this moment, and it's not, because we, what we're feeling is, yes, you know, there will be the effects of changes in monetary policy, but until we solve the supply chain disruptions, we're, we're not gonna get to where we need to be. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'll let the economists Great. argue over Let's take two more questions, if, if you may. Um, go ahead, please. Awesome. Hi, I'm Iyad. I'm an international student, currently pursuing my uh, Master in Engineering Management. And my question is, how is managing a very large corporation different from managing like a small corporation, like a small startup? And how applicable are the uh, leadership lessons in terms of kick-starting a project? For example, bootstrapping or you know, raising funds. What's the main difference between both? Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you asked this question because one of the things I wanna ask this audience is how many of you have uh, built any project management skills? Are there people in the audience who've been, yeah, you've had to lead teams. That are, project management is the most valuable basic skill you can have today as you enter the workforce. You will be in hot demand. Everyone needs people who know how to plan, you know, schedules and budgets. Now. Uh, with that said, I mean, here's the basic lesson. Everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten, the same thing is true when it comes to managing a business. Your first first line management um, experience is, it will, it will rock your world, right? When suddenly you are the topic of everyone's dinner conversation when they go home. When suddenly you're the person responsible for salary increases and, and, and professional development of a team of people and I don't care how big your organization gets, you will always be managing a direct report team of people. And you want to treat them so well that they will treat their direct reports the same way. And they will treat, and this is how culture it gets imbued in an organization. The same thing applies to so many aspects of large business management. It all begins with the atomic particle. Just like two people over a napkin are the cause of all innovation, all plans are the same, and you build them up. They get to be grandiose. 
Are there special things you need to learn in the corporate world? Oh, treasury topics, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, but, but those can all be learned. And, and I, I just think it's funny. I, I've always been a big company gal, but what I've started to discover is that I've been one of the startup entrepreneurs inside the big company mm -hmm. throughout my career. Thank you. Awesome, thank you Great. very much. Let's take one more question. Uh, to end it all today, thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a PhD candidate in mechanical and aerospace engineering, and I have a question concerning the competition in the leadership domain. So my question is, how would you assess the competition, and what method would you use to create strategies to compete with your competitors? Ah, com competition, and I told you we would come back to this. Thank you for bringing me back. Um, I've been talking to my colleagues at Siemens about the idea that in this moment, in this particular moment of history, let's not think about competition. Let's think that we're all in this together. And by the way, I'm not talking about anti-competitive behaviors and you know, I, I, we're not gonna do the things that, you know, that in, inappropriate collaboration, we're not gonna do that. We will still come to the field of play and give it our best and actually compete against folks, but I'm not thinking of them as to the death competitors. If you haven't read um, Anti-Fragile, it's a, it's a good book to read. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb talks about the concept of anti-fragility. The idea that it's possible to build structures that get stronger through disruption. Right, we take a vaccine and it makes our bodies, our immune system stronger. We work out, we disrupt our muscles, it makes our muscles stronger. And corporations have typically been fragilistas. I wanna win at someone else's expense. The, the statement that I'm making right now inside my company is there's only two states. There's win-win there's and there's lose-lose. Mm. And so our job is to find how we complement others. How do we bring solutions to the table that accelerate others' success? Uh, in simple terms, let's make the pie bigger mm -hmm. instead of like seagulls scrapping over french fries on the boardwalk when there's a whole french fry stand you know, right, right down the boardwalk. I, I want people to shift their focus and see things differently. And so at Siemens, we're changing the way we think even about our business models and we're using the concepts of the platform revolution. How do we create value in a way that invites others to join us and create value as well? And, and then how do we deliver that into the marketplace? Deep, deep, deep topics that each deserve um, mm -hmm. uh, conversation, but, but, but you know, the key question is, what are we uniquely good at? And then what would it take for us to build that next skill that our customers are asking for? And if it would cost more to go build that ourselves than it would to partner with someone who has invested deeply to provide that capability to the world, let's go partner. Great. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. What an inspiring conversation and really wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you for coming here and thank you all for joining us today as well. Uh, our next George Talks Business uh, episode is going to be from New York City on Monday and the, a panel will be talking about the New York um, State, uh, New York City real estate market. So that I know may, many of you may not be able to travel, but it will be live streamed. So please tune in for that. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.